I'm standing in the forecourt of Pachyaman Koyal Temple. Uh, Bhagavan stayed here on several occasions over a hundred years ago. And the reason he came out here was that there was a severe outbreak of bubonic plague in Tiruvannamalai around 1905 and there was an order to evacuate the whole town. This particular temple, which is on the outskirts of town, is just over the town boundary, so Bhagavan was allowed to move in here and remain here for the duration of the plague epidemic. Now what we're seeing in front of us are pre, uh, pre-Vedic village Hindu deities who are the guardian spirits of village and town boundaries. It's an old Tamil tradition that there are spirits that patrol your village or town boundary at night and that you propitiate them by coming to these temples and making offerings. You build fearsome looking soldiers like this who are the embodiments of your spirit and when you have a full platoon of ferocious foot soldiers to patrol your village then you invest in terracotta horses, terracotta elephants so in a sense, this is the garrison for the spirits that patrol the Tiruvannamalai boundary every night. So this particular temple is fractionally outside the town limit. So this is on the border and the spirits from this place traditionally march or ride around the Tiruvannamalai town border keeping its inhabitants safe. Uh, Ramana Maharishi stayed here on several occasions in the first decade of the last century. Uh, probably 1905, 1906, 1908 and there is also a photo of him on a rock here which is dated in an old ashram book from 1911. Uh, at that time he and Ganapati Muni lived together in uh, a small room surrounding the mother's shrine at the back of the temple. It's uh, difficult to say, see exactly where he was but he said that uh, later building developments had added a lot more but when he first came in 1905, it was a very small structure, just the inner shrine with the goddess and her partner inside. Uh, there was a renovation later, um, five or six years later, and Bhagavan and Ganapati Muni decided they'd come and have a look and see what was going on. And fortuitously, the builders, the contractors, were just finishing up their work as they arrived, and they treated this as a great... Uh, a great stroke of good fortune that Bhagavan had arrived on the day their building was finished. So they put on a big show, fed them, looked after them, and that was the way the original extension to the temple was consecrated around 1911. Ganapati Muni seemed to like this place also. He uh, composed some of his famous poetry here, and when he came to give a public reading of it, he elected this place to have it read out. Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarga Vimochana Meyam Virayma There's one particular story that I love from this place and this was told by Chaganlal Yogi who was the ashram's printer in Bangalore in the middle late 1940s. I have no idea where he got this story from but uh, it's one of my favourites. When Bhagavan lived here he was on very friendly terms with the monkeys who played in the trees nearby. Uh, he could talk to the monkeys and they used to come to him and use him to arbitrate their various disputes. Also in the neighborhood there was a Muslim contractor who had successfully given a bid on a stretch of tamarind trees nearby. In British times the British government used to plant tamarind trees by the sides of roads and then put the crop out for auction and the money which they got from the successful bids would be used to maintain the highways. So this, this was a very elegant, effective way of keeping the roads maintained, keeping a good supply of tamarind in the market and making sure that pedestrians and bullock carts on the road had some shade as they went on their travels. So once you've got the successful bid in the auction, it's your responsibility to protect the fruit to make sure that no one steals it. 
The monkeys, of course, didn't know anything about the contract, so they continued to climb the trees and steal the contractor's fruit. The contractor had uh, a catapult. He wasn't aiming to do any damage. He just wanted to wave his catapult and let, let off a few uh, volleys at the monkeys to dissuade them from taking the fruit which he'd already paid for. Unfortunately, one of his stones hit one of the monkeys. It fell out of the tree, hit the ground and died. Now this made the other monkeys very angry. They actually picked up the dead body of this monkey and brought it to Pacham and Coyle, presented it to Bhagavan and informed him with their usual angry screeches what had happened. Bhagavan sat quietly for a while trying to mollify them, placate them with his silence, but after some time he said, everything that's born in this world has to die. This contractor who shot your friend, one day he will die also. You yourself will die also. Everything that is born is destined to die. And although this wasn't a particularly profound statement, it was just a, a statement of fact, somehow this placated the monkeys enough that they picked up the body of their friend, took it away, and presumably disposed of it somewhere. News of this interaction between Bhagavan and the monkeys got back to the Muslim contractor, and he must have heard the exchange in a garbled form. When Bhagavan said that the Muslim contractor will one day die, somehow that was conveyed to the contractor as Bhagavan cursing him in some way, and that he was going to die as a result of what he'd done. This was never Bhagavan's intention. The contractor was worried about this, so worried in fact that he got seriously ill. He told his family that he'd been cursed by Bhagavan and that if something wasn't done about this curse he might die because that was the curse that had been put upon him by Bhagavan. The family came to Bhagavan, explained that the contractor had been taken seriously ill and asked for some vibhuti to smear on the affected man to cure him. At that particular time there was a famous uh, Swami in town who was giving out vibhuti with the claim that it would cure all the diseases of the people who came to him. Bhagavan said, I never bless anyone, I never curse anyone, I haven't cursed your relative, I simply told these monkeys, everything that's born in this world one day has to die, this contractor will one day die just as the monkeys will die, he isn't going to die because I cursed him, he's going to die because everything that's born one day has to die, it's nothing to do with me. The relatives refused to accept he hadn't cursed the contractor and they insisted on getting some vibhuti from Bhagavan's hand. So in order to get rid of them, Bhagavan, uh, who had a cooking fire in front of him, took a pinch of wood ash from the fire, gave it to the relatives and say, try this, put it on your relative, maybe this will do some good. The relatives were delighted, they took, uh, took the wood ash back to their contractor relative, they smeared it on him, and since the, uh, since the disease was entirely psychosomatic, the Muslim contractor made a speedy recovery. Namo Ramanayana Lamperavarna Vimochanamiyam I'm walking along the backside of the tank which adjoins Pachyaman Koyal Temple. This is significant in Bhagavan stories for several reasons. When uh, Bhagavan and the ashram devotees went for production in the early days, they would often spend two or three days, and this is one of the spots where they would stop and camp. Often on day one, they'd go to Unamale Tirtum, which is about a third of the way around the hill. The second day, they'd slowly meander their way here, spend the night here, and on the third day, they'd go, go back to wherever they were staying on the hill. Now one reason they came here is this water is a perennial source, it's not dependent on any stream from the hill, it seems to have an underground spring. I used to come here in summer 30 years ago and swim here, the water seems to last all year round. And Bhagavan was fond of swimming here, he was an excellent swimmer, Ganapati Muni used to swim here when he was with Bhagavan, and Ganapati Muni had a son uh, who also used to swim here with Bhagavan. And, uh, Bhagavan has told a story that this son almost drowned him here on a visit that possibly took place in 1911. Uh, Bhagavan was swimming here, this boy who was then about eight years old,
got on his back and tried to ride him like a horse. He was like going, hey, giddy up, giddy up, like this. And uh, Bhagavan said he was a bit tired that day and the boy almost drowned him and he had a, a big physical effort to make it across the tank and get out the other side. When Bhagavan and Ganapati Muni stayed here around 1905, this was their uh, in-house swimming pool. Bhagavan has reported that he and Ganapati Muni used to swim here regularly and they used to have swimming competitions to see who was the, the better swimmer. No, uh, no, no reports on who won that one. However, Bhagavan, um, there are reports that Bhagavan used to float on his back in Padmasana in a tank near Ramanashram and he was the only person who could do that without sinking. So for some, re for some reason Bhagavan had a very, uh, a very floaty body. Everybody else could go into Padmasana, but when they tried, their bodies started sinking. Namo so in, in much the same way that this tank was uh, a valued water resource for the people, it was also a valued water resource for the animals on the hill. And when Bhagavan came here uh, in the first decade of the last century, the main reason he was here to stay was the town had been evacuated. So that meant that the big cats, the tigers, the leopards, were able to encroach on the town and they were a bit more brave about showing themselves in daylight and to the public. So when Bhagavan stayed in the temple next door, he said there was a tiger who used to come and frequent this tank. Uh, one devotee who used to support Bhagavan in those days, Rangaswami Iyengar, uh, he came screaming into the main temple one day saying, Tiger, Tiger, Tiger! And Bhagavan came out to look and there wasn't a tiger there. And he said, oh, you're making it up. And he said, no, 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 there's definitely a tiger there. But on a, on a subsequent occasion, Bhagavan said there was a tiger and the tiger would come down, drink here, and then go back up on the hill. In, in summer, there's a limited number of places that big animals can come for water. And the tigers, the leopards, they all used to come to this place when Bhagavan stayed in the temple. He said there were two leopards who also used to come, uh, but Bhagavan generally would say these large animals, they would give a kind of roar as an announcement of their imminent arrival, and then they would give another roar when they were about to leave, and Bhagavan, who could understand their intent, used to tell everybody, don't worry, they've just come to say, I'm here, I'm going to have my water, and when they finished, they'd make another noise and say, I'm going away. He said, there's no reason to be afraid, they're not hunting for dinner, they've just announced their presence so that we won't be afraid of them and they can have their water in peace. When I look at old photos of Arunachala taken 90, 100, 110 years ago, they all, without exception, portray a bleak, barren, rocky, treeless landscape. I'm absolutely amazed that these leopards and these tigers could survive here, but survive they did till well into the 20th century. I think probably the last tigers disappeared somewhere around the later years of Virupaksha Cave. There are no sightings beyond that point. And the last leopard, to my knowledge, the last confirmed sighting was about 1950 or a little bit later. Uh, Chalam, who wrote uh, a book about Bhagavan's devotees, he mentioned that after Bhagavan passed away, almost everybody left the area around Ramanashram. The place became a ghost town. And he has written that leopards were prowling the streets at that time because there were so few people to contest the space with them. One, uh, one problem for deciding exactly when tigers disappeared and when leopards disappeared is that there's one generic term in Tamil that describes all the big cats. So you're not quite sure when people in the old days talk about tigers or leopards that they tend to use a word that could mean either. And some people even claim they saw cheetahs, although I think that's extremely unlikely since Tiruvannamalai is south of the historical maximum range of the cheetah. In the early 1980s, uh, the printer I used to print my own books, he gave me a copy of a very nice illustrated encyclopedia that had been brought out by the Bombay Natural History Society, and it contained photos of all the indigenous big cats of India in there native environment. 
I took it round to all the old devotees who had lived with Bhagavan uh, at Skandashram in the 1920s, and I said, which, which of these animals personally have you seen in Tiruvannamalai? And every single person I showed it to, that would be people such as uh, Ramaswami Pillai, Kanju Swami, and Amalai Swami. They all pointed at the leopard, and none of them had ever seen a tiger, none of them had ever seen a cheetah, but they all had first-hand direct contact with leopards, either in the night at Skandashram or in the 1920s and 1930s. Despite the bleak and barren, treeless nature of the mountain for decades, some animals did cling to existence here. Uh, there are still jungle cats in Katusiva Forest, uh, one of them was caught on a nighttime camera trap. And there are also confirmed sightings of the rusty spotted cat, which is one of the rarest of India's native cats. That was spotted on the hill a few years ago. No one has actually seen a leopard here for at least 50, 60 years. Except, I must add, as a kind of addendum to this story, about uh, three months ago, a local goat herder, who was herding his goats not far from where I'm sitting, claimed that a tiger jumped out from behind a bush and ate one of his goats. Uh, stories like this have to be investigated, even though nobody believed him. The villagers stuck to his story, the forest department came out, they checked for pug marks, any tiger activity, and they reassured themselves that there was no tiger in the vicinity. I think it's possible, though, that what the villagers saw was a leopard, and if it's so, I'll be delighted. I think this place needs a leopard or two. In the last 20 years, the trees have grown back on Aranachula. We now have a dense forest, perhaps 20 square kilometers. It's full of prey that leopards would enjoy. We have a burgeoning deer population, which is uh, eating away many of the young trees. We have far too many monkeys. I think a leopard would be quite at home here. I've been told and I've read that leopards can walk up to 40 kilometers at night looking for food, new adventures, new places to live. I think it's possible that one of these peripatetic leopards took off from wherever it was, walked here one night, arrived and thought, this is leopard heaven. I've got enough food here to last the rest of my life. So I do really believe that it's set up camp somewhere near here. And in the not too distant future, I expect to see more leopard reports somewhere in this area, because this, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the few places where a big cat can guarantee to have water 12 months a year. Ganapati Muni met Bhagavan. He had a very positive experience and ended up proclaiming him Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi. About a year after that, he found himself staying with Bhagavan here in Pachyaman Coil. And on that particular stay, he had a vision which convinced him that Bhagavan was an avatar of the god Subramanya Skanda Murugan. Uh, he saw six stars slowly descend onto Bhagavan's head and merge into one somewhere on Bhagavan's forehead. Now this echoes the traditional story of uh, Subramanyam that he was formed from uh, six babies, six stars, which merged into one. Now the idea that Bhagavan was somehow the second son of Shiva wasn't original to Ganapati Muni. Shishadri Swami uh, had decided a few years before that Bhagavan was also Subramanya, on what evidence we don't know. But Shishadri Swami used to regard himself as Parvati, and Bhagavan as his son. So the Bhavana, the peculiar relationship that Shishadri Swami had with Bhagavan was that he was the mother of, he was the mother, the consort of Shiva, and Bhagavan was Shiva's second son. So it's quite possible that Ganapati Muni had heard this from Shishadri Swami, and possibly the idea had been implanted in his mind. There are recorded instances of people going into Bhagavan's presence and thinking, I would like to see my particular deity in front of me. I would like Bhagavan to manifest as this god or that god. There's one particular story I recollect by a devotee called uh, Vitoba Kamat. So he suddenly had the thought, I want to see Krishna. And suddenly Bhagavan turned into Krishna sitting on his sofa. 
And then he thought, well, I'll try, I'll try somebody else. Let, let's, let's, let's see if I can think about him being, taking the form of Gandhiji and see if he turns into Gandhiji. So he just had the thought, please turn into Gandhiji. And Bhagavan's form on the sofa turned into Gandhiji's form. So there's something about the powerful presence of a jnani. If you are somebody who has visionary predilections, or you have a particular idea that the person in front of you is a particular manifestation of the deity, then that in itself could cause or trigger some kind of vision to take place which would confirm your original conviction. So my, my particular feeling is that Ganapati Muni already had some idea, possibly from Shishadri, that Bhagavan was an incarnation of Subramanyam and that when he saw these six stars, merge into Bhagavan's head, that confirmed his original conviction. Now, Ganapati Muni wrote Sri Ramana Gita uh, in the second decade of the last century, and he wrote a couple of verses in there in which he had a succession of incarnations for Bhagavan. Ganapati Muni didn't stop with claiming that Bhagavan was an avatar of Subramanyam. He had three incarnations that he allocated to Bhagavan before his final birth. After uh, Subramanyam, there was a philosopher called Kumarila Bhatta who lived about a thousand years ago and then he said after that there was a very famous saint called Jnana Sambandar. Now Jnana Sambandar uh, is one of the most distinguished and famous Tamil saints. Bhagavan loved him a lot. He used to quote his poetry a lot. So you can possibly understand why Ganapati Muni might want to associate the two. There isn't much to connect Jnana Sambanda and Subramanian, although there's a very famous saint of Tiruvannamalai called Aranagiri Nata who lived almost 800 years after Jnana Sambanda and he was the first person to say that Jnana Sambanda had an association with Subramanya and might have been a second birth of Subramanya. But that particular story wasn't claimed by Jnana Sambanda himself and none of his uh, followers, none of the Saiva devotees of the next 800 years even thought about it. This story only came into being around about the 1400s when Aranagiri Nata wrote it down in one of his poems. So that connection is a little bit tenuous. And the even more tenuous connection is this odd claim that Bhagavan used to be Kumarila Bhatta. Now, Kumarila Bhatta was a very distinguished Vedic scholar. He was a contemporary of Adi Shankaracharya. He had specialized in Vedic rituals. He's written uh, a long work of commentary on Mimamsa philosophy, which is still read and studied today. And he, at the time, was worried that the Buddhists were encroaching on traditional Hindu areas, that more and more people were accepting Buddhism. So he wanted to study Buddhism with a view to refuting its central tenets and getting Hinduism uh, to recapture some of its philosophical space. So he secretly became a monk in a Buddhist monastery and learned contemporary Buddhist philosophy. And at the end of his uh, lessons, he, was, he challenged a Buddhist teacher to have a debate on the validity of the Vedas. Now, the Buddhist teacher, of course, was very scornful of the Vedas, so he started ridiculing the Vedas, at which point Kumarila Bhatta burst into tears. His, his beloved Vedas were so, so dear to him, he couldn't stand anyone criticizing them, even in a debate. At that point, the, uh, the Buddhist teacher realized that he was an imposter and wanted to know who he really was. So Kumarila, Bhatt, Kumarila Bhatta confessed and said he'd just taken this course in order to master Buddhist philosophy so that he would be able to counter their arguments in public debates. This, this was deemed a very uh, uh, unacceptable way of gaining knowledge in those days. So Kumarila Bhatta was sentenced to death by the Buddhists and ordered to be thrown off the top of a cliff. So he was taken up to the top of the cliff, at which point, just before they threw him off, he said, if the Vedas are true, may I be spared death at the bottom of this cliff. They threw him off and he did survive at the bottom except that he was blinded in one eye. So the, the traditional story of his life is that 
he didn't have complete faith in the Vedas. He said, if the, if, if the Vedas are true, may my life be, sp be spared. If he, said, if he had said, because the Vedas are true, my life will be spared, he would have showed more faith and he wouldn't have been blinded in one eye. So he went back to Allahabad, Allah, Allahabad in North India, which is where he was doing his studies. And after some time, uh, he had a, an attack of remorse. He realized he cheated his Buddhist teacher and he was also very sad that he hadn't expressed full faith in uh, the Vedas by saying, if they are true, as he was being thrown off the cliff. So he decided the only appropriate course of action was to set himself on fire and commit suicide. So he made a large pile of paddy husk, put himself on top of it, and just at this moment, who should come into view but Adi Shankaracharya? wanting to have a debate with him on the merits of Advaita versus Mimamsa. So uh, Kumarela Bhatta said, sorry, uh, my life is over. If you want, you can go and debate with my disciple. But I've taken this decision. I've, I've done two bad things in my life. And for me, the only, the only possible recourse is to set fire to myself but if, if, you, if you want to do me a favor, please chant the Taraka Mantra as I, as I set fire to this bonfire and self-immolate myself. You, 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 can, you can chant the appropriate mantra, mantras and then go off and debate my disciples. So Kumarela Bhatta set himself on fire. Adi Shankaracharya just watched singing this Taraka Mantra as this man went up in flames. Then later he went on to debate the designated debater that Kumarela Bhatta had sent him to and defeated him in debate. So that's an entertaining hagiography from a thousand years ago. The principal problem, as Bhagavan himself pointed out when this particular sequence of births was mentioned, was that it wasn't possible chronologically. That to go from being an avatar of Subramanian to Kumarela Bhatt to Jnana Sambanda didn't make sense. It was a complete anachronism because Jnana Sambanda probably lived some point in the 6th century and Kumarela Bhatt as a contemporary of Adi Shankaracharya didn't come along till two or three hundred years after that. So Bhagavan never specifically said that sequence or those people are wrong. He just rather gently poured scorn on the sequence saying it wasn't possible because it was an anachronistic sequence. When Bhagavan was asked about his status as an avatar of Subramanya, he wouldn't confirm it and he wouldn't deny it. So this, in fact, encouraged people to continue with the belief. If he just said once, that's nonsense, then the whole idea would have been dropped. But he accepted that certain people benefited from viewing him as an avatar of a particular deity and he didn't want to destroy their faith, so he would permit them to have whatever beliefs they wanted to and this in turn just encouraged other people to take on board these somewhat strange ideas. So per Paramal Swami, who was his attendant at Virupaksha Cave in 1913, was one of these people who thought that Bhagavan was an avatar of Subramanyam. At that time, uh, some of the more literary devotees used to compose verses uh, praising Bhagavan, identifying him with some uh, famous god or famous guru, and then they would sing them in Bhagavan's presence. So Paramal Swami went up to Bhagavan privately and said, Bhagavan, I'm not a poet. I have no knowledge of literary Tamil. I'd, I'd like to sit in front of you and sing a song praising you as Subramanyam. Can you help out? So Bhagavan, just to help him out, composed a verse in which Bhagavan himself is praising himself as Subramanyam. But it doesn't mean he was actually claiming to be Subramanyam. He just wanted to help out a devotee who had that particular conviction. So on the next occasion that uh, devotees presented their offerings, Paramaswami stood up and sang his Bhagavan Your Subramanyam song and Bhagavan was quite happy to accept that his devotee was praising him as Subramanyam even though he himself didn't have that particular belief. When he was asked about this verse about 20 years later, he said, uh, the, handwrit the handwriting is mine but the sentiments are Paramaswami's meaning quite clearly, I, I did this as a favor to a devotee who wanted to praise me in a particular form. There was one other very well-known instance when Bhagavan was specifically asked 
about who he was in his past lives. And that was a man on the hill, uh, Virupakshi Cave. And I want, I want to read this out because it's a very important answer. Uh, the devotee was called Amritananda Yati. And he posed a question. And the question was, who is this Ramana in the Arunachala cave who is renowned as the treasure of compassion? Is he Hari, who is Vishnu, Shiva Guru, who is Subramanyam, Yati Vara Shiva, or Vararuchi, who, that's an odd one, who is a scholar in the court of King Vikramaditya? I am desirous of knowing the Guru's greatness. Bhagavan then composed a verse in which he gave his true identity, not as one of the gods, but who he really was. And this is what Bhagavan wrote. In the recesses of the lotus-shaped hearts of all, beginning with Vishnu, there shines as absolute consciousness the Paramatman, who is the same as Arunachala Ramana. When the mind melts with love of him and reaches the inmost recess of the heart, wherein he dwells as the beloved, the subtle eye of pure intellect opens and he reveals himself as pure consciousness. So what Bhagavan is saying there is you can ask me, are you Vishnu, are you Shiva, are you anybody else? And if you want me to give a correct answer, I'm going to say I am Paramatman, I am the Supreme Self, I am consciousness abiding in the heart of all beings. Now, Bhagavan himself, although he didn't encourage or discourage any of these particular beliefs, on a very, very few occasions just gave a couple of hints that makes me think that this whole sequence of gods and gurus couldn't possibly be true. Now he has given um, an answer to Shuddhananda Bharati who wrote his first biography in Tamil in which he said that when he was very young, even before he had his self-realization experience in Madurai, he was taken over by temporary states of complete inner stillness and that he said that they were as a result of what he called vitakurai. Vitakurai is a Tamil word which means karma left over from a previous lifetime which compels you to behave in a particular way in this lifetime. So he said there was a kind of compulsion to perform or do a spiritual practice in this lifetime which led him into these inner peaceful states. And in talks he says, my, purv my purva vasanas, purva vasanas are the vasanas that you've inherited from a previous lifetime. My purva, purva vasanas took me straight to self-inquiry. I'm glad they didn't take me anywhere else, otherwise I would have wasted my time. I'm so happy that my purva vasanas took me straight to inquiry. So here we have two isolated statements. The one about the karma from a last life compelling him to behavior in this life. And then specifically he said that what this past karma was, was a compulsion to do self-inquiry in this life. Now if you start with those as your two known facts from Bhagavan's previous lives, then I would say that you can't take him to be a Vedic scholar who specialized in Mimamsa philosophy. You can't take him to be Jnana Sambanda, who in my opinion was a fully enlightened guru who never did self-inquiry anyway and certainly didn't need to be reborn to carry on with the sadhana. My feeling is that he was a very advanced devotee who had been taken up by self-inquiry in a previous birth and had been doing self-inquiry so strongly that that karma manifested when he was a young boy before he even knew anything about self-inquiry. That karma started to work in him and that karma bore fruit in the final experience in Madurai when he just asked himself, who am I once and realized the self? Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarga Vimo Janameyam Viraim I'm sitting on the side tank of Pachyaman Koyal Temple and I would like to tell one of the stories that Bhagavan told about living here. Before I do, I should like to say that Bhagavan really had a problem in asking anybody for anything. He had this conviction that whatever he needed would come unasked and he never felt it was his job to tell his attendant or anybody else that he was in urgent need of anything. So this story takes place in 1906 at a time when Bhagavan was living here and Palanaswami, his principal attendant, had for reasons which are not 
uh, mentioned in the story, disappeared for some time. So Bhagavan was on his own for all his uh, day-to-day needs. During this time, he had a cowpina, which is a strip of cloth tied between his legs. That was his only item of clothing. And a towel. Now, when you say towel, don't think of something large and fluffy that you use in a Western bathroom. Think of uh, the sort of thing that you might dry your dinner plates on on a kitchen. It's kind of more, more like this size. Uh, a little bit thicker than you'd make a shirt out of, but not really uh, thick cloth. So these towels are often used as scarves, as an extra item of clothing, but also if you go for a bath, you use it to dry yourself afterwards. So at the time of this story, Bhagavan realized that the two bits of cloth that he owned, his cowpina and his towel, were both wearing out. But he didn't want to tell anybody about this, so he went to extraordinary lengths to cover up the fact that these two items were getting more and more uh, dilapidated and worn. He said the towel, uh, he would come down to this tank, he would bathe in it, he would dry himself off in it, and then he would roll the towel up into a kind of bundle so that people couldn't see how many holes it had. He said bit by bit, by bit it got in worse and worse repair until he said, Towards the end of the ditch use, it probably had about a thousand holes in it. So that's quite a significant number of holes for a piece of cloth that's only about this big. So he took to bathing secretly, drying himself secretly when nobody was looking. There was one devotee called Sesha Ayer who was responsible for looking after him in Palanaswami's absence, but somehow Sesha Ayer hadn't noticed that Bhagavan's towel was in such a poor state nor did he notice that the cowpina was also falling apart. Um, Bhagavan used to roll up the towel eventually and hide it in a hollow tree because he didn't want people to see what a horrible state it was in. And when he needed a bath in the tank, he would wait till no one was around. He would go to the tree. He would take this ragged old cloth out, go down for a bath, get out, dry himself, put the towel out to dry on one of the rocks here, all the time looking to make sure nobody would spot it. And then when it was dry, he'd roll it up in a bundle again and put it back in its tree. Uh, one, one small boy caught him doing this, and as a, jo- as a joke, because of its disreputable state, he says, Swami, Swami, the, gov- the governor has sent me from Madras. He wants this towel. It's a very important towel. You must give it to me. And Bhagavan laughed and said, no, 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 I can't give this towel, it's very valuable. And the, the, ch- the children were sent away. So although the children could see, sorry, this boy could see what a poor state the towel was in, none of Bhagavan's attendants had taken the trouble to find out. Now his, his other item of cloth was his cowpina. And he said that too was falling apart. And he thought for a while, he said, I can't go naked, one has to respect the laws of decency. He was naked for a while in the temple in the 1890s, but he appreciated that uh, he couldn't walk around with no clothes on here. So he had to keep his cowpina in a decent state of repair. So eventually he hit upon a solution. He took a thorn from a local tree, took another thorn and drilled an eye in the thick end of the thorn and made a homemade needle out of it. And then he took one thread from the cowpina, the outermost thread, and used that, he threaded that through his thorn needle, and then he used that to stitch the holes of his cowpina. And he said, every, every time that I got a new, a new hole or a new tear, or there was some more damage to the cowpina, I had to slowly, slowly reduce its size. It got thinner and thinner, because I, I, I was taking more and more threads out of the cowpina and using them to stitch stitched the original cloth with this thorn needle, which I invented myself. Finally, of course, he was caught by his devotees, who were all mortified that they'd let uh, Bhagavan's needs be neglected for so long. Apparently, there was a huge box full of spare towels, spare cowpinas. Somebody was keeping them in town. Just nobody was on the ball. No, no, nobody had spotted that Bhagavan was in such urgent need of a new cowpina and a new towel. So he had to resort to these extraordinary lengths to keep his cloth in workable, usable condition without having his devotees know that he needed something new. So Murugana eventually heard of this story and there's a nice line in one of his poems that 
describes Bhagavan as Venkata, who was served by Indra. Indra is the god with a thousand eyes, so he thought the Tao was Indra. Uh, so the thousand holes in Bhagavan's Tao became the god Indra, and Raghuna wrote a poem saying that god Indra came and served Bhagavan in the form of a Tao with a thousand eyes. <laughs> Namo Ramanayana Lampera Varna Vimochana Meyan I'm sitting in front of another tank which is slightly down the hill from Pacham and Coil because I think this is the location of a story that uh, Bhagavan told on a couple of occasions. When he had to evacuate to Pacham and Coil because of the plague, the town was taken over by government officials whose job was to disinfect the streets and make them habitable for when the all clear was announced and people could go back home. So people would occasionally come to Pachamako, the government workers. I think there were still some fairly senior government people on hand and they had a good working relationship with Bhagavan. They, they'd come, they showed him great respect and occasionally they would come and eat in Pacham and Coil. After the whole town had been properly disinfected, uh, the, the government people wanted to have a celebration, possibly celebrating the fact that they'd survived the plague as much as anything else. So they invited Bhagavan to attend a big bhajan uh, at this particular tank. So I'm guessing this was probably 1905-1906. Bhagavan said yes, yes. And when Bhagavan says yes, yes, doesn't mean he's really interested, he's just meaning he hopes you go away and forget all about it. Uh, but in this particular case they didn't, and a few days later he said he was woken up in the middle of the night by, he said, a, a huge delegation bearing torches. Now I think probably means long, long sticks with flaming fires on the end. It would be quite an intimidating group to be woken up by. And he was told that all the preparations had been made, and that he had to come down and be the guest of honor at this particular bhajan which was taking place near this tank. He said, I was by myself, what could I do? And I had no one to help me or protect me, so I was more or less marched down to an area close to this tank where he said they'd set up this enormous showcase event. He said all the big important people from town were there, collectors, tasseldars, senior police officials, but despite having all of these people, he was given the, the seat of honor, everybody prostrated to him. And then there was a continuous bhajan performance somewhere in this area, which he says went on all night. He said it was such an elaborate show that the foodstuffs were on display like they are in a five-star hotel nowadays, not simply there to be taken and eaten, but ar arranged in little entertaining mountains or decorations on the side so you could go and take pieces off as and when you needed. Bhagavan said, I, was, I wasn't compelled to do anything. I turned down all attempts to feed me. I just sat there for the whole night. And when morning came, I went back home and was glad they hadn't tried to make me do anything else. Now this reminds me of one other odd story that was told to me by Ramaswamy Pillai back in the 1980s. He said that when Ganapati Muni initially was a devotee of Bhagavan, he was full of enthusiasm that Bhagavan was the, the greatest guru in the world and that Bhagavan should go on tour and travel all around India to meet new people and hand on his teachings. Now, of course, that's the last thing in the world Bhagavan would ever want to do. He, he didn't like being the center of attention. He didn't like traveling. He didn't like going away from Arunachala. So I think possibly Ganapati Muni hadn't quite appreciated the depth of Bhagavan's reluctance to be the center of attention, his complete unwillingness to travel anywhere except somewhere within sight of Arunachala. So he came to Pacham and Coil and he proposed an all India tour and Bhagavan sort of nodded or said yes, yes. And Ganapati Muni was encouraged by this to believe that Bhagavan would actually come with him on the appointed day. So Bhagavan uh, forgot all about it, but Ganapati Muni didn't. And some weeks later, on the appointed day, Ramaswamy Pillai said that Ganapati Muni showed up here with a, with a huge herd of horses, and he was riding one of the horses. Uh, all of Ganapati Muni's own followers were in tow, also on horseback, and he seriously expected Bhagavan to get on one of these horses and get a gallop off around India on a tour to collect new devotees and hand out his teachings. 
on this particular occasion, there, there was no way that Bhagavan was going to cooperate. He just said, I, 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 ne I never agreed to this. I'm not, I'm not going to leave. You've just, you've taken this, all this too far. I, I stay here at Aranachala. I don't go anywhere else. There were several other occasions in later years when uh, less grandiose schemes were hatched to get Bhagavan to go on tour and meet devotees all over India. And my favorite answer from Bhagavan, who had no intention of going anywhere, was, what, what's the point of taking me anywhere? What's the point of taking me all over India? Wh wherever I go, I only see the self. I may as well stay here and see it here. Namo Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarga Vimochanamiyam Virei Malattarvarga Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarga Vimochanamiyam Virei Malattarvarga Adi Mudit Kundaya Anadit Todarvin Vira Mudiyamim 